Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being with us today, and welcome to the ninth lecture of Current Topics in Heritage Science, organized by Iberian HS Academy and the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science. My name is Hassan Abate, Marie Curie Fellow at University of Ljubljana in Slovenia, and I'm moderating today's lecture. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions, which the speaker will answer at the end of the lecture. If you have any, if you have any technical difficulties, you can contact us using the chat. The lecture will also be available as a recording on our YouTube channel. Today's lecture is about a very important topic for all those working in, in the field of heritage science, such as scientists, conservators, creators, stakeholders, and other decision makers. And the lecture is under the title Ethical Sampling from Seed to Fruit and Beyond. It is our pleasure that the lecture will be, we will be delivered by a specialist in the field, Dr. Michaela Botticelli. Dr. Michaela Botticelli received her PhD in Earth Sciences from University of Sabienza in Rome, where she worked on the development of criteria to distinguish the origin and the provenance of, of red pigments. And then she had a grant at the same university to study pottery from an archaeological site near Bethlehem. She's also worked for two years as a conservation scientist at the Central Institute for Restoration in Rome. There she examined mural paintings, ceramics, stones, and glass artworks using a variety of analytical techniques. And since, since 2021, she's working at University of Glasgow in the research project, Photonic Imaging Strategies for Technical Art History and Conservation. And without further ado, good afternoon, Michaela. The screen is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for inviting me here and for this opportunity. Um, I'm Michaela Botticelli, and today I'm going to share my screen and um, tell you about my experience with that full sampling. Uh, give me a second. Right. Can you see my screen? Okay, so um, the title is somehow explained uh, by this quick overview of this lecture, because my idea of um, ethical sampling starts from uh, the legislation, if you want, so from the stand, the British standard in 2012, and then goes on with the ethical sampling guidance that was released in 2019, and then uh, with a lecture that was given by Anita Kwai in the year a year after, and with a case study that involved me personally in 2022 and that I think is quite representative of the process of sampling in cultural heritage. And finally, I will also tell you about um, the survey, um, this year's survey, and um, tell you how this survey that um, probably some of you have filled is in line with the ethical sampling guidance and also with the criteria that guide all of us working in heritage science and in conservation. So if we start from the British standard, um, the important one that we have to keep in mind if we want to carry out um, a sampling in cultural heritage, it's it's the BS EN 16085, uh, released in, 2020, in 2012, which um, tell, uh, tells us about the criteria for sampling, 
and also how to uh, conceive the sampling plan, but also gives us um, a very practical tool because in this first British standard, we find an example of a sampling data sheet that we can fill whenever we have to carry out a sampling. Um, so starting from the concept of sampling, that is a destructive action, when we deal with unique artworks, we have to strongly justify this action and we have uh, to carry out a close uh, consultation with all the people involved in the process. And this is why we have to respect somehow the owner and the authorities policy, but also minimize the sampling. And this is the key concept that the minimal sampling that we find um, in all the steps um, that um, after the British standard. So both in the ethical sampling guidance and in the criteria that guide uh, most conser conservators and heritage scientists working with sampling. Uh, in the British standard, another important aspect is that we have to um, decide and discuss a plan. And it is really important, in this sense, it is really important that we guarantee an interaction between the scientist and the owner um, of the artwork. But it is also important that we decide prior to sampling where we would like to take the sample from and the type of sample we want to have in both in number, amount and nature. But it is also important that we decide uh, where the responsibility is. So the person authorized for sampling and all the people involved in this process. And this is somehow uh, where, um, where the ethical sampling guidance um, takes its depth. So if we go on, in 2019, the ethical sampling guidance was released thanks to the work that, um, done by Anita Kwai at the University of Glasgow and Matthias Str uh, Strelich. Um, at that time in the Eigen Committee and uh, in UCL. So uh, the guidance was released by the Eigen and uh, in a way it summarized not only the British standard, but also the, um, the results of two different moments of survey, but also a workshop um, holding Glasgow in 2017. So we can, in a way, it, um, it sets the principle on how the sampling should be done, because once more, it stressed the fact that um, sampling should be done after a discussion, as well as the criteria for sampling should be uh, fixed in a discussion, in a discussion that involves all the people that are responsible for sampling, from the scientist to the conservator to the owner of the artwork itself. So uh, if we um, consider the key concepts of the ethical sampling guidance, uh, it starts as a collaborative and transparent action that should also be, um, be the result of a balanced, objective and consistent discussion. And this is probably the key part of um, the process of sampling. So uh, we will see what are the steps in the sampling process. And I think the discussion, we can state that the discussion is the first, but also the most important moment. But since the British standard does not deal with the decision process, and um, it does not tell how the sample has to be used, uh, the guidance in a way fills the gap. And so it offers some practical and workable recommendations. And we can intend that Mm, these guidance both for unexperienced researcher, researchers, but also for the experienced operators. Um, so um, it offers, in a way, a tool 
And first of all, it states what the important steps and moments of the sampling are. As we said, the first most important moment is the discussion. But then there are also some um, more official moments, if you want. So the sampling request and the agreement before the sampling itself. And in these moments, uh, in these different steps, different people are involved and somehow share responsibility. So in the discussion, we find that both the researcher and the owner are involved or the custodian of the artwork are involved. And in the guidance, we find a kind of checklist that is for the research and it is really useful in this moment of discussion. For what concerns the sampling request, um, this is, we can say that this is the responsibility of uh, the researcher or scientist involved in the, in the sampling plan. And uh, it is the responsibility, the researcher's responsibility to um, address, to e explain the sampling plan and strategy to non-informed, um, to an informed non-specialist. So it is very important that this plan is clear and well designed. Um, during the sampling agreement, which is a further step after the request, uh, we find that the owner or custodian is more, more directly involved. And this step ensures that um, the object or the site of sampling is viable for research. So it has um, as well a quite important um, aspect. It is a quite important aspect. And then the sampling comes, but it can only come, it can only come when all the other steps are taken. And um, it also involves some completion steps, as we will see. So if we have a look at the flow chart that is um, in the ethical sampling guidance that is um, that can be downloaded for free from the ICANN website, and I kindly invite uh, those of you that are um, still unaware of this tool to download uh, the guidance, because the flowchart is quite practical. So it's a practical tool for all the people involved in the process. And it considers all the steps that we have seen until now. And specifically, it states um, and it gives an idea of uh, when each person is involved in the process. For example, if we take a look at the first step, that is the discussion, we see that uh, both the researcher and the owner are involved. But if we go on with a sampling request and the sampling considerations, we see that uh, the researcher alone takes this responsibility and is responsible um, for explaining how the sampling should be done and what are the most important aspects of the sampling to the other people involved in the process and then is responsible for the request. Then the role uh, of the owner comes out and the owner is responsible for the sampling decision. So in a way, uh, the flowchart clearly elucidates what, where the responsibilities are. And after that, when the sampling agreement is in place, again, both the researcher and the owner custodian are involved in the sampling uh, in sense restricted and then at the end of the project to disseminate the results, uh, for example, or to return the sample or the object itself, but also to verify that the policy, the owner's policy has been respected. Now I will go on and I will tell you about uh, the single steps of the sampling process. And contemporarily, I would like to show you the results of the survey that um, probably most of you have, um, have filled. Because in a way, um, even if 
for some of you, the ethical sampling guidance was uh, was not known. In a way, I, I think that the criteria, the main criteria that ensure an ethical sampling are respected and well known. And for what concerns the discussion, for example, it is interesting to see that uh, what comes first in a way during the discussion is the research question. So in a way, it's the research design for what are the questions to be answered and for what is the type of analysis that wants to be carried out. But it is also important to consider what the object is, because this determines what, um, in a way, what kind of analysis we can carry out and what kind of samples we can take in terms of amount, in terms of number, and in terms of nature of the sample, as we have seen in the British standard. But it is also important to respect the owner's policy and to maintain a kind of research integrity, which can be, which is somehow dependent on the uh, agreement of the principal investigator, for example, or on the some ethical considerations in terms of um, type of research that we can, that we need to consider before we take the sample. Um, and in a way, uh, so even if uh, some people may, be, may not be aware of the British standard because they work in a different country, for example, the survey uh, collected most of the um, responses from Europe, but also from, from America and Africa. So um, in a way, even if the British standard doesn't have to be applied or is not known, um, the criteria stated in the British standards are known and respected by scientists, conservators, and all the people involved in the process of sampling. Especially the fact that, for example, we need to define what the sampling plan is. We need to uh, be aware of the condition of, of the conservation state of the artwork before we take the sample, but we need also to minimize the sampling, and this depends on the type of sample we need, but also on the type of investigation we want to carry out. Um, so, um, for what concerns the request, uh, that is um, from the researcher's perspective, so it's re researcher's responsibility, um, from the survey, we can see that some considerations are more important than others when the request is um, when when the request starts. And if there's more agreement on how to um, how the sampling should be done on the sampling method, there is a kind of um, there is less agreement on. Um, the sample, for example, um, where the sam where the object is during the sampling, and also on the costs of sampling. And in my opinion, uh, I think this depends on the fact that nowadays most of the projects are um, uh, funded by uh, by Europe, for example or are funded um, from are funded by international fundings. So um, in a way, the costs or sampling need to be predicted. So in a way, there's uh, some money is allocated for sampling as well. And this is probably the result of the diffusion of ethical sampling practices. Um, and also it is interesting to see that it is not it is less important that object uh, stays on the place where it is uh, usually stored during the sampling probably because nowadays we are more aware about the uh, the process of moving on how to move the, the the object from one place to the other and we have some procedures in place so we can ensure that even if the object is not in the place where 
it usually is, we can ensure that the object is moved safely and the sampling is safely carried out, even in a place that is different from um, the place where it, the object usually is, like the museum where it comes from. Um, going on uh, with the next step, that is the decision and the agreement on sampling, there is in a way some kind of higher agreement. Um, um, I would like to remind you that the survey was not only for um, people involved, people coming from museums like owners, custodians, but uh, most of the people answering the survey were people from conservation science even if there were some people from institutions and museums uh, answering um, the survey. And by the way, the highest agreement is in this uh, step of the process, of the sampling process. And in a way, it reflects the fact that um, the decision has to be uh, clear, as well as the question and the, the aim of the research. And it is also important to stress um, where the sample is taken before sampling and the type of an investigation. And this is also this is especially from um, the, um, the perspective of uh, the owner and custodian. So the owner pretends uh, needs um, to know exactly where the sampling is carried out and what are the risks and limitations of these steps? Um, it is in a way less important that, that um, there is open access to the results of this investigation and to the impact of social media in these um, in the whole, whole investigation. And I think this is an aspect that is uh, growing at now, nowadays, and it was less important like um, five or ten years ago. So we are moving towards um, higher open access and higher impact of social media, but there's still more disagreements somehow on this aspect. Now, if we move on to uh, the sampling uh, itself, so to the most important step of uh, the sampling process, we can see that some trends, some criteria are already in place from the researcher perspective. So it is very important to record, to record the sample location and also assign a um, consistent identifier to each sample because in a way, uh, it is clear that we can minimize the sample if we can reuse a sample that we have already taken, for example. So if we know where exactly the sample comes from, and if we know the type of sample because we have a unique identifier and we have information linked to this identifier, we can somehow minimize a new sampling, a new sampling activity. At the same time, it is also important um, that after sampling, we have raw data in a very in an accessible format. So it is important that um, we state before and after the sampling itself in, in the type of format we want to store, um, we want to use for our raw data and the type of format we are going to share with the owner custodian. Uh, there is some kind of less um, routine on um, two other aspects of the sampling, like uh, the time. And this was also um, coming from another question from the survey. So in a way, uh, we know that there can be some um, limitations that can be some errors during sampling. And this has an impact on the time scale, for example. So in a way, we can see that there can be some risks during sampling, during the whole sampling process. And we know that we have to consider these risks even before, but also after the sampling itself. 
if we now take a look at the um, at the perspective of the owner and custodian, we have some key aspects that have, uh, again, from the survey, more or less importance from the owner's perspective. So uh, for the owner and or custodian, so from people working in an institution and being less aware of um, the, the investigation, it is really important that um, they know the type of analysis that is carried out. It is very important to, to know what the outcomes, the possible outcomes could be. And if we can answer the research questions with the type of investigation we plan. So this is again, this somehow remarks the importance of the discussion phase because it is really important that we are, we, the researcher is able to share and to explain to the owner um, what are the aims of the investigation, because this also has an impact on um, the importance of the investigation and um, possible outcomes for the institution itself. Um, and it is also important, but probably less than uh, than these other aspects, that uh, if, whether the object has been requested before. So as we said, we can minimize the sampling even if we use samples that are already stored in the proper conditions in a research center, for example. So it is important to know whether there has been some research on the same object before. Um, after the ethical sampling guidance, uh, there was a lecture um, by Anita Kwai released in 2020. And I think it's quite important to um, be aware of both the ethical sampling guidance, gui guidance, but also the lecture, because in a way it um, fills some gaps. Um, so in this lecture, we can uh, we can find some practical examples um, on whether the sampling is essential. So and the type of sample and the fact that it. It is strictly linked to the type of investigation we want to carry out. And um, there's also another key concept that is stressed in this lecture, and it is the fact that sometimes sampling is not essential. So we have to consider the fact that we have non-destructive tools and whether these tools are available we can um, consider not to take the sample, for example, or uh, depending on the research aims, we can consider uh, the fact that sampling may not answer the, the questions or may not be um, representative enough to, re to respond and to answer some questions. And so in a way, um, the possibility and the um, the fact that we are going to uh, sem to carry out the sampling or not strictly depends on the plan and on the type of investigation we want to carry out. But there's also another aspect that is important in this lecture, and it is a kind of failure analysis. So uh, the lesson stresses the fact that uh, there can be a no coming, for example, from the owner custodian whether they consider that the sampling is not possible or not essential. And um, this is also important to, to be considered because um, it can be that the sampling is not possible because of the object um, conservation state or because we don't meet, we can't meet the owner's policy. So, in a way, we have to keep in mind that a no is possible. Um, even if this sampling, for example, does not answer the research questions we have in mind, or even if these research questions are not important for the owner custodian. But what is important if we get a no is that we rediscuss we have some options to rediscuss with the owner custodian and we have we can redesign our plan, for example, or consider 
some non-destructive strategies. And another important, uh, what, another failure step can be the sampling decision. So we can get a no when uh, the owner custodian needs to decide uh, for the sampling, or so right before the sampling itself. So we can get a no, and and at this step, it is also important from the owner's perspective to offer a feedback and from the researcher's perspective to request the feedback and also and have a kind of revision on the subject because it is important to understand whether we can um, get to the sampling step again or whether we can uh, choose a different methodology, for example, or choose a different um, time scale or budget uh, to take the sample. So now I will give you uh, some examples on, on the sampling. So that, that's the, practi the practical part of the lesson, let's say. And these examples come from my direct experience. Um, this is one of the most recent experiences at the University of Glasgow, where we had the chance to uh, take some samples from the painting, the, um, the easel painting, Actors Farewell to Andromar from, by Gavin Hamilton. And um, well, the, so the object of the investigation was uh, the painting, and we were particularly interested to understand the painter's technique, but also to understand um, a kind of uh, di diffuse deterioration phenomenon on the surface of the painting. So we decided to um, take some samples. Some of those were already uh, uh, fading, uh, were already um, uh, loose fragments. So we decided to collect these samples and to consider them to study the stratigraphy of the painting, but also the degradation, as I said, uh, using the, the instruments we had at the Calvin Center. So basically, we wanted to use optical microscopy, FTA mapping, and semi DX. So we wanted to get to a cross section. And in this case, um, since we knew the type of investigation and um, the research aims, but also the type of sample we wanted to get, that is a cross section, um, we had basically all the, the necessary information to carry out the sampling. Um, and in this case, what I would like to stress is that we we are facing a painting uh, that is on canvas with a known structure. So, so we know the type of layers we can expect for this type of, um, of painting, of artwork. And we also know the dimensions somehow. So we know that we don't need um, a big fragment uh, for this kind of investigation. And this is to stress that uh, the type of artwork we are dealing with as an impact on the uh, design of the research and and also on the type of sample um, you want to get. So if you see, if you take a look at this stratigraphy, we, we can see that um, it's more or less um, 300 microns uh, in thickness and this is what we wanted to get to understand um, possible degradation phenomena, not only at surface, but also at the level of uh, between the canvas and the ground. So we want we needed to make sure that we had somehow the whole stratigraphy in our sample, but we also um, knew that the technique was um, it was an easel painting. So we uh, we weren't in need for a big sample. And this is quite important because if we compare the size of that sample with another um, investigation that was that I carried out with my colleagues at Sapienza University in Rome, um, you see that there's a difference in the size of the sample that depends on 
the type of object I'm going to stem um, to um, to consider for sampling, but also the type of investigation. Uh, for example, here we were going to um, analyze to take some samples from these uh, carinated balls. We had these fragments, and we needed we can we needed a thin section to be produced from these samples. And these and the the type of sample we need to prepare has an impact on the size of the sample we we can take, and we need to explain these to um to the owner in this case um these samples were um coming from the department of archaeology so um there was a there has been a moment of discussion where we explained the type of activity and the aims of the investigation for example because we wanted to know um the production technology and to discriminate a specific a very specific production the metallic ware um in this site to the far north on in the west bank so we we needed this type of investigation that implies uh, thin sections and the study of these thin sections using optical microscopy together with um, other techniques that involved another type of sample in powder. So in a way, we needed two different sampling and sampling steps, one for the thin section and one for the other techniques uh, for X-ray diffraction and um, thermogravimetric analysis. So we knew the amount of sample we needed for both um, type of samples. And we could explain this to the archaeologists. So we agreed, we finally agreed that the sampling was possible because of um, the type of sample we had, the type of fragments we had that were stored, not exhibited. They belonged to some balls, but they were fragments, the only remaining fragments from the ball. So we decided that the sampling somehow was justified by the type of investigation, because this, uh, this the metallic ware, the type of production we uh, we wanted to characterize was um, quite specific. So we needed the samples to um, understand the production for this center and understand how specific it was for this location and for that historical period. So we decided that the type of sample we needed and the type of investigation were compatible in a way and the sampling was possible according to the owner or to the custodian in this case. So we decided to carry out the investigation. Um, there, um, there can be other cases where uh, we don't, need, even if the type of uh, sample of the type of objects we are going to study is similar. So we are again dealing with pottery, and um, but the, in this case it's an ethnographic collection. So even if the type of object is the same, we can have research questions that are different and then imply a different type of sampling. For example, in this case, we were interested in, in the characterization of um, this type of uh, dye, of brown dye that we, we were seeing on the surface, at the surface of, the, um, of this bowl of both balls. These are two different balls um, coming from Museo delle Civiltà in, in Rome. Um, and we wanted to characterize these um, this type of dye um, or, or pigment. We didn't know at that time, at the, at the time of the sampling plan, but we knew what we could do in the less destructive way with the techniques we had at Istituto Centrale per il Restauro, where the investigation was carried out, were um, instruments that allowed a micro sampling. So if you see this diamond cell, uh, well, the the window uh, that allows the uh, to to carry out um, FTIR in transmission is quite small. So it ranges it's about two millimeters. Um, in size. So um, 
we we really needed a micro sample, just a few, um, well, let's say less than one milligram of sample. So we knew that a micro sampling was possible to try to answer the research question with one, one instrument. And so we decided to perform um, this type of analysis with a very small uh, sample. We decided that together with the um, uh, restorers at ICR, we decided that the sampling was possible and that we could answer the question. And in fact, we were able to characterize um, this dye as um, coming from Gam Guayak. Um, finally, I would like to tell you about one of the most uh, recent case studies in, in my research experience at the Kelvin Center for Conservation and Cultural Heritage Research in Glasgow. And the study was carried out together in collaboration with the Ontarian. Um, and it's a kind of sequel or um, of um, a research that had been published um, about the authentication of some Roman coins um, coming from Romania. So basically, for the first time, we applied micro FTIR in a non-destructive way. So in reflecting using external reflection on a series of coins to prove that the, um, the minerals we could identify on the coins were compatible with a prolonged burial, and then to prove together with other techniques, the authenticity of these coins. Um, so a first, uh, the first investigation was carried out on the coins. And then we decided that um, we needed some standards in a way, because when you work, uh, as most of you probably know, when you work with external reflection, you can have spectral distortions that lead to um, spectra that are different and not comparable with, for example, the uh, the library, the transmission or ATR library that you have. So the identification is quite tricky, especially if you work with um, minerals or mineral species uh, for which you don't have a spectral reference, a spectral reference in your library. So basically, the problem here was to have a comprehensive spectral library to interpret the spectral distortions we were seeing working with um, micro uh, particles on a gold surface. So basically, what we were observing was um, the result of an interaction not only with the mineral we wanted to characterize of the infrared source, but also with the gold surface the minerals were relying on. So we wanted to make sure that the spectral pattern we were seeing was consistent with the mineral identification we had carried out on the coins. And especially with degradation products that are um, that can be found on coins. And this is why I asked for Erika's help. Erika is the, um, the curator of the mineralogical collection and the, um, at the Ontarian. And so there was a first discussion um, with her to explain the type of sample I, I was in need, I was trying to find, and uh, the type of help I could um, gain from her, from the Ontarian, but also the type of help I could give to, um, to the museum. And uh, this was a discussion in person, but it was also, there was also a follow up by emails. So, um, and this is just to remark that the discussion step is quite important and it is important to stress. In this case, Erica, um, didn't know about the possibility to work in external reflection and to use FTIR uh, in external reflection to characterize um, the minerals in the Ontarian collection. So not only we could answer some questions that were arising from our research on the Roman coins, but we could we could also try to answer some questions from the Ontarian, that is, we could also be able to confirm 
the identification of the mineral species in the Ontarian collection. So in a way, I tried to explain to Erica the, pot the possibilities given by the instrument um, and the type of questions we had, but also the type of questions we could answer from the Ontarian side. And um, in this phase, it was also important to um, let Erika know the type of sample uh, that could be used for FTIR investigation. And since we were trying to build and or to enlarge our uh, spectral library, um, this was also the chance to collect, um, well, analysis to collect data, not only from external reflection, but also um, from ATR or transmission in a way that we could compare the spectral response um, using different methods. One that has um, like, a li an established library and one that doesn't have a spectral library. So we wanted to make sure that the spectral um, pattern we were collecting in external reflection was consistent with ATR or transmission measurements. So it was particularly important to explain the all the steps and all the type of information uh, we could gain from uh, the analysis of the samples in the Ontarian collection. Um, so the ethical sampling guidance offers a kind of checklist that is for the researcher, but also for the owner custodian. In so, this... Michaela, there yes. was a time because you are getting a little bit further. Okay, uh, so I'll be. I'll try to be quick. And can I have one minute? Yes, of course. You are. Okay. <laughs> So um, if you, well, the checklist is particularly important because you can answer questions um, that makes you understand whether you meet um, the uh, characteristics of the object, but also the policy of the owner and also some research integrity. And we could answer yes to most of the questions here during uh, the discussion with Erica. And um, also we were able to prove that the sampling was essential, not only for the research um, on the Roman coins, but also for the museum with the type of investigation. So there was a, um, this was explained in a discussion, but also during um, a series of emails. And there was finally a formal request from my side and um, with Erika, we agreed that the sampling was possible, was essential, and was also helpful for both of us. So we came to a sampling agreement that is a document that the Ontario Museum has, and I had to fill, providing my details, but also the project information. And this is quite useful. Um, and it can be in place in some institutions, but it's also useful if you realize if you design some a similar document whenever you perform a sampling where you also state the object information and uh, after the sampling agreement uh, the sampling was carried out on in march this year and there's and finally after collecting um the raw data Raw data were at the project and were shared with Erika in different formats. And they will be stored in the digital database of the Ontarian Museum. So it is important that not only I uh, preserve the results of the research, but these results are shared with the owner and custodian because it is important that they have the results. And uh, in fact, they were useful to prove that um, the identification of the mineral species in the Ontarian was correct for most of them, except for one. Next, it can be from the survey, we got some interesting suggestions. Uh, most of these are um, towards, the, the, towards providing some case studies. And I hope this lecture was particularly helpful for you to have more case studies and to get an idea of the practical steps of sampling. 
And also this dimension is also important. And I hope this lecture moves um, towards this sense, but also there will be other steps to uh, for dissemination of the ethical sampling steps that we need to have in our own uh, education and in our own working activities. So uh, thanks to all the people that invited me to give the lecture, but also helped with their work from the previous years. And this is the last slide for you, Hassan. Yeah, thank you very much, Michaela, for this wonderful and interesting presentation and talk. Uh, thank you. And now we will give our audience a little bit, a few moments to write down their questions. Uh, and in this time, I would like to announce the next lecture of the Green HS Academy and the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science, which will be given by Dr. Rivio de Loca on the topic toward this Cathedral of Digital Data and Multidisciplinary Knowledge in Heritage Science.